Welcome to the Power Play YouTube channel. How's everyone doing tonight? Well, I thought tonight it's kind of late. This is kind of last minute. I say late. It's really late for the Europeans. Still pretty early for the Australians, but get a little bit later here. But there's been a number of uh, you know new filings for. The Coburn Netflix uh, or the uh, Coburn B Netflix case, actually nine documents today. I think, of course, a lot of these are really short documents, and there's really not a whole lot to them. But um, we had, I think, four from uh, last week that we really hadn't read. I think we talked about them quite a bit, but I wanted to go ahead and get those kind of on here on YouTube and. Um, so we could, you know, that could be talked about. Uh, and there's been several new, you know, kind of developments, I guess, as it were. We've talked some about that um, with, uh, you know, this whole roundabout here is about Netflix. Or, uh, yeah, Netflix wants the Michael Griesbach to produce uh, documentation leading up to, you know, writing his two books. And that led off into... Uh, third party uh, getting talked about and mentioned in their discussions with Andrew Colburn. And um, as we've talked about, there are thousands of text messages that uh, were discussed that the judge was actually supposed to either release or something today, and that didn't happen. We don't have them. We thought we would. but So apparently someone has objected, and those are still being held. So anyway, I'm going to start back. Let me get this pulled up here. Yeah, I'm, I'm solo right now. I think Susan's going to try to join, but I kind of sprung this on everyone. So uh, don't, don't, don't blame everyone else. They're, they're probably off doing their own thing. I'm, I'm not sure what they're doing. Like I said, I, I kind of sprung this. I kind of felt froggy and it was a good time. No one was really on. And um, so I'm sure people are still looking You're at solo. I'm here. Oh, wait, what's going on here? <laughs> what in the world? Hold on. Here's, let me get you tuned. Let me get you tuned up here on. Uh, just a second. There we go. You're going to pop in there. Now. There we go. So, yeah. Well, thanks for coming, Saprik. I appreciate that. Yeah, I had to. I had to slip in in my ghillie suit. <laughs> so what we're going to be starting with, I'm not sure if you probably looked in the text channel there on Open Mic. I've got all the documents listed there, and you know, most of these are very short. Now there are a couple of them that are a little bit longer, but um, let me get this pulled up here so we can start looking at them. Now this first one, there we go. That's going to pop in there. Yeah, this first one's document. Um, this is document two twenty four, and I'm just going to go through and knock a few of these out because, like I said, I think these first four are really short. So this is. Uh, a notice of appearance. Please take notice that April Rockstead Barker and Rockstead Law LLC appear as co-counsel for the plaintiff in addition to counsel previously noticed of record for the plaintiff. And this is on the 31st of May. There's that one. And then, yeah, this is 235. Supplemental notice, a supplemental disclosure statement in addition to the information Supplied pursuant to civil LR 71 or 7.1 and Fed R, whatever all that is, in docket number 28, filed on April 16th, plaintiff supplements his disclosures thereunder by adding the following law firm appearing on behalf of plaintiff in the above matter. And that's right, because that law, which we just talked about. And again, 31st. This next one. Is another one page document. This is uh, two. I think this is 
it was 236. Um, notice of motion and motion to withdraw as counsel for interested party, Michael Griesbach. We've talked about this one. Please take notice that um, Mayor Graff and Wallace, LLP, as attorney, Michael Griesbach, moves the court. The Honorable Brett Ludwig presiding for permission to withdraw as attorney for Michael Griesbach. Counsel has been discharged by the client. The basis for this motion is set forth in the affidavit of John Mayer, which we'll get to. The same already on the with, with the court dated the third day of June 2022. So I'll pause right here just for a second. Uh, comments there, uh, Saprica? <laughs> uh well, good job, Mr. Griesbach, uh, in recognizing that your lawyer was shit. Yeah, I think his performance in the oral arguments was pretty terrible. Yeah, he was <laughs> he was rambling uh, to the point of almost incoherent. Yeah, he was, and breathing into the phone. That was really, really irritating, man. It was like eight yeah, minutes there. He was, he was just like, <sighs> man, get the phone away from your mouth. I'm actually surprised someone didn't tell him. <laughs> Me too, like the judge or somebody. No, but I'm, uh, I'm, I'm kind of, well, I don't know I want to say I'm shocked, but uh, he, he, he took that action pretty quick. He was quick to dump that guy, so. Yeah, I'm just going to get that there was, uh, you know, more fireworks behind the scenes that we didn't get to know about. Be my guess. Yeah. Okay. All right. This next one is document 237. Uh, okay. Yeah, this is the avid. This is the affidavit. Looks like Stamper's got a call. Texting. Stamper, you're not so muted. Stafford, you're not muted. There we go. Now he's muted. Okay. So let me get back over here, too. All right. This is the affidavit of John Mayer being first duly sworn on oath, the poses, and states as follows. Number one, I'm the attorney, attorney for uh, Michael Griesbach in the above captain action. Number two, the S affidavit is made in support of the motion to withdraw as counsel for Michael Griesbach. Number three, Mr. Griesbach has charged the services of moving counsel and Mayor Graff and Wallace can no longer represent a client who has just charged it. Number four, Mr. Griesbach has made, has made has been made aware of this motion, which was provided to him via email and regular U.S. Number five, my withdrawal will not affect the, uh, the deadline for the briefs and the scheduling of the motion hearing. Yeah. That's not true, but we'll get to that. This is on the third day of June, 2022. Now, we're going to get into the stuff that was filed today. So, get over to that. I'm going to close some of these other ones. Get them out of the way. Oh, yeah, you know what? I don't have to. This is document 240, I think, da uh, uh, dash one. It's exhibit nine. This affidavit of service, and we can see here, um, state of Wisconsin, you know, we've got the case number, plaintiff Andrew Colburn, the defendant Netflix Incorporated, um, for Godfrey and Khan SC, it's like out of Appleton, Received by Patrick L. Zel Zelzer and Associates to be served on Michael Griesbach. Uh, I, Patrick Zelzer, being duly sworn, depose and say that on the 10th day of February 2022, at 10.17 a.m., I individually, personally, served by de delivering a true copy of the subpoena to produce documents, information, for objects to permit inspection of premises in a civil action with a date and hour of service endorsed thereon by me to Michael Griesbach at the address, gives the address there, and informed said person of the content therein 
in compliance with state statutes. I certify I'm over 18. Yeah, yeah. And then it's, uh, you can see the seal there. So he was served with subpoena. This is document coming up 240.2. This is exhibit 10. Again, this is from today. This is a nine page document, it looks like. Let me pause here just for one second. I know it's late and we don't have too awfully many in the chat. Let me first go over here and say hello to TTM Fangirl and Cherie. I'm not sure who else is here. There's not many of us, but it's a few and I appreciate everyone that's coming and listening. This appreciate it. I appreciate, can't say, say how much I appreciate Cherie for her diligently staying on top of this and getting us these documents. Um, if it wasn't for that, it would be far more difficult. Let me just put it that way. So anyway, let's get back. Okay. Okay, this one here is plaintiff's responses to defendant Chrome Media LLC's first set of in, in, their in, interrogatories. I can never say that word properly. Interrogatories, inter, yeah, interrogatories. Hopefully I didn't butcher that too bad, Sheree. Plaintiff, Andrew L. Corwin, by and through his attorneys, law firm of Conway, I can't even pronounce, I can't, Ol Olenz, Ol Olzenak, I I'm saying that wrong, and Jerry S.C. responds to defendant Chrome Media's LLC's first set of interrogatories as follows. General objections. To the extent of any of the interrogatories call for information which is protected by the attorney-client privilege, work product, doctrine, or otherwise immune from discovery, plaintiff hereby objects to furnishing any such information and such information is not being provided. To the extent that any of the interrogatories go beyond the scope of federal R. Civ page 26, plaintiff objects and will comply only to the extent of the obligations set forth therein. Plaintiff also objects to the wording of the defendant's request on the basis that Wisconsin law requires that defamatory broadcasts be considered in their entirety, not just as a collection of alleg allegedly separate statement. The entire man broadcast must be considered with respect their falsity and defendant's knowledge of falsity and or reckless disregard of the truth with respect to the broadcast. Plaintiffs objects to the interrogatories to the extent that they, they suggest or imply otherwise. Discovery and investigation are continuing in this manner and plaintiff reserves the right to amend and or supplement the, these responses accordingly. In addition, plaintiff's counsel has only just been able to format produced raw footage to viewable format and have not had the opportunity to view it yet. And again, plaintiff reserves the right to supplement his response accordingly. Subject to the foregoing objections and the specific objections asserted below, plaintiff respectfully submits without in any way conceding relevancy or admissibility the following responses to the in interrogatories. Interrogatory number one, identify with specificity, specific, I can't say that word either, specificity, all spliced and omitted portions of plaintiff's trial testimony as set forth in Exhibit A and B that you contend distort the facts and nature of the 1994 or 1995 telephone call and led viewers to falsely, falsely conclude that plaintiff bears responsibility for seven or eight of Avery's 18 years of wrongful imprisonment, providing him, Colburn, with a motive to frame Avery for Hallbach's murder, as alleged in the paragraph 27 of the second amend, amended complaint. Response number one, subject to plaintiff's general objections, plaintiff refers to the summaries attached to the in-chart form here too, discovery and investigation are ongoing, and plaintiff reserves the right to supplement his responses accordingly. 
interrogatory number two for each, quote, spliced and omitted portion, end quote, identified in your response to interrogatory number one, state how that spliced or omitted portion, quote, distorted the facts and nature of the 1994 or 95 telephone call and let viewers to falsely conclude that plaintiff bears responsibility for seven or eight of Avery's 18 years of wrongful imprisonment, providing him, Colburn, with a motive to frame Avery for Hallbach's murder, end quote, as alleged on paragraph 27 of the second amended complaint. Response number two. Subject to plaintiff's general objections, plaintiff refers to the summaries attached in chart form here to discovery and investigation are ongoing, and plaintiff reserves the right to supplement his responses accordingly. And we like that the same, exact same answer as response one. Okay, moving on. Interrogatory number three, describe in detail all facts that you contend support your allegation in paragraph 33 of the second amended complaint that, quote, defendants knew of the falsity, end quote, of Stephen Avery's criminal, attor- uh, criminal attorney's suggestion that plaintiff was looking directly at the Hallbox vehicle when he called dispatch, end quote. This one's longer. Response number three. Subject to plaintiff's general objection, plaintiff re- responds as follows. Plaintiff's testimony at the civil trial regarding the call that he made to dispatch was reasonable and credible, and he specifically denied that he was looking at Hallbach's vehicle during his testimony. In addition, upon information and belief, the defendants had reviewed the Avery trial court's decision and order dated January 30th, 2007, which explained that any theory regarding any alleged involvement of the plaintiffs implanting Avery's blood in Hobbalt's vehicle was extremely weak and rested on an unexplained contradiction. As pointed out by the state at oral argument, how could Link and Colburn have known that Teresa Hobbalt was dead at the time they allege, they are alleged to have planted the defendant's blood in her vehicle? Under the defendant's theory, either Link, Colburn, or both would have had to have uh, formulated a plan involving their own commission of serious felonies and executed that plan within a very short uh, period of time, motivated apparently only by their embarrassment for not allegedly having acted more responsibly on information that could have led to Mr. Avery's exoneration back in 1995 or 1996. Decision and order at page 11. It was only due to the extremely low bar afforded criminal defendants by law to attempt to offer theories to attempt to exculpate themselves that this theory was even allowed to be presented by the judge. Under any common sense or reasonable standard, the assertion that Plaintiff had found Hallbach's vehicle prior to the time that she was known to have been deceased was obviously Defendants are educated persons. Both have advanced degrees. In addition, Ms. Riccardi has a law degree and has practiced law for some time after graduation. Accordingly, it is reasonable to infer that both Riccardi and Demos knew that there was no reasonable basis to believe that plaintiff planted blood in Avery's car, that any theories to the contrary border on the fantastic and are patently ludicrous, and therefore, they knew they were false. Interrogatory number four, describe in detail all facts that you contend support your allegation in paragraph 40 of the second amended complaint that, quote, defendants manipulated facts to convince viewers that MTSO officers possibly, including plaintiff, secreted a reason blood from a vial still kept in evidence from his wrongful conviction case and planted it in Hallbach's car, end quote. Response number four. Subject to plaintiff's general objections, plaintiff responds as follows. The facts that support the allegation that defendants manipulated the facts in question are set forth in the remainder of the paragraph 40 of the second amended complaint. Upon information and belief, defendants had reviewed the Avery trial court's decision and order dated January 30th, 2007, in which the court noted the fact that the state intended to present evidence that the hole in the blood vial stopper had been created 
by the phlebotomist who withdrew Mr. Avery's blood on January 2nd, 1996. He backs Africa. Sorry, yeah, I had a had a call. <laughs> yeah, that's what I figured. I, I I heard you talking there for a second, and you muted. Okay, um, you've been listening along. I'll I'll pause here at uh, number five. Any thoughts so far? I I just hopped back in. Um, give me a, a a Cliff Notes version. Well, basically, uh, Coburn's saying that. Demos uh, and Riccardi knew better than to try to spin this kind of a theory that that painted him and and the you know other MTSO officers in a bad light. That he you know there was no way he was looking at the at the RAV when he called the dispatch. Basically, that's what he's saying that they and they knew it and they boarded basically on the fantastic. Oh right, of course. <laughs> So that's kind of where we're at. Um, a lot of you know, law, wordy lawyer stuff. Hey, so the, this is this is his lawyer's arguments about the confidentiality stuff because I thought that's what no. these briefings were supposed to be. No, not this, not this particular one today. No, not this one. No, we're, huh. there's there's some other. I think there's some other stuff coming that that uh, touches on that a little bit. That. Um, yeah, I mean, that judge said he was going to release the, those text messages today if there hadn't been some kind of objection file. And um, I haven't read through every single bit. I mean, I scanned through all of it, but I, I haven't. I think there's one document in here that's like 27 pages long. I haven't read through all that. So there may be something there that I haven't read yet. Hey, Calf. Hey, um, well, Calf was here. There's Susan. Yeah, I think... Uh... There was supposed to be something in the reply briefs from Colburn's lawyer that would address why the third party, that being Transition Studios, um, should have had the opportunity to chime in or speak to their uh, position on confidentiality with regards to those texts. So there, there must have been something, either that or... It just takes longer for the court to release something. Um, well, I, I think the I think that judge. I mean, he's pretty clear in the the oral arguments. You know, if I don't hear anything by the eighth, they're going to be released on the ninth. So there must be yeah, something. You must yeah, be right. right. I, yeah. So yeah, you know that gets into some really. Uh, I mean, it really drives off the the case into a, a kind of a sideways thing. And I do remember reading something that we're going to get to that. Uh, I don't know what it's going to do, honestly. I'm just not lawyer enough to say. Susan, are you here? Let's see. Not I see you. Muted. No, I see you must be having trouble getting her mic to getting her mic to work. To, hey, boy. Uh, Mr. Hey, there's Mr. Jones. Hey, there's Mr. Jones. Oh, I just thought I'd pop on, uh, you guys. Uh, I'm, I don't know a lot about this, but I'll follow along with you. I think it's uh, super interesting. I, I think I'm with Zap, Zap or Cop right now. I need the cliff notes, but uh, yeah, for sure. Let's see what's going on with this. Well, I mean, I mean, th this part here is really about the main part of the case, you know, about um, what was left out, what, what, what got you know, jostle around in the actual documentary that this is directly addressing that. And this is a, the interrogatories there, Susan, I can hear her now. I did for a sec. There you go. You're on. I don't think she can hear. Me. Okay. Well, um, I'm going to keep on. We're on number five. I don't know if there's any questions. Let me look at the chat right quick for a second. If there's any questions, I see Crockett's, Crockett has joined us. And uh -huh. who? Hey, Crockett. Cap was in here for a second, but I bet she didn't know we were live. <laughs> and she says, no. 
you know, there's only one thing that I uh, it gets me about Colburn that kind of, and maybe it's like uh, just mincing words here, but I feel like when they ask him, were you looking at the Rev? And he's like, no. Maybe he actually wasn't looking at the Rev. Do you know what I mean? But he had it just written it down. Do you know what I mean? He just walked away from the Rev and he had it on. So when he says, I wasn't looking directly at the Rev when I called in the plates, isn't a lie. Does that make sense? Yeah, it's possible, I guess. You know that... Even though we know what we know what like what is implied in that, but he's but he's going, well, I was actually staring at it. And I think that's how sometimes people justify their lies. So things like that. Yeah, what? but he he knows he knows what we're referring to. So exactly. even though at the moment he made the phone call you know, if he was walking away or something like that, you know, if, if that's if that's a game he's going to want to play, he's going to fail. Um, because at, at the end of the day, prior to him making that phone call, he had already gotten all the information about that vehicle from two other sources. That's there was bingo. absolutely zero reason for him to make that call. Bingo. Absolutely right. And, and that's and where I the feel- that's, that's where the perception. Go ahead. Yeah. Absolutely. I sometimes I feel like the discrepancy of the color of the rav in the different light, just like Pam of God was like, but it's kind of bluish. Like maybe that's why Colburn called it in because it was like this. I thought it was supposed to be greenish. You know what I mean? So maybe he was uh, double checking, right? Because he was not sure. Same thing that well, Pam that, of God did. Yeah, that that that's actually been my argument for why I think he made that call was because when he came upon it, he was expecting to see a blue RAV, and that's not what he had. Or or he was expecting to see a green RAV, and that's not what he had. So now he's got to call it in and verify, oh, my God, is this actually the vehicle that we're looking for? Right. Oh. Yeah, that makes sense. It, it, it does. You know, perception is everything, right? It is. Yep. So. Uh, Can you TT, hear me now? There she is. Just going through my laptop. I don't know why my earphones aren't working. Anyway. Uh, well, maybe you can get them working on later. Well, thanks for coming, Susan. Did you have a good dinner? Yeah. You did tell me 9 o'clock, Jeff. Central Standard. Did I? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> my bad. <laughs> <laughs> I always get that hour, and I was, yeah, okay. That's my bad. I, I should have known. Yeah, you should have. You like. Are you really, are you talking about Central or Eastern? Yeah, and then that would have cleared it right up. Um, well, you put PST. Time. Yeah, we got to go by Manitowoc time. Apparently. <laughs> hey, uh, TT. Well, and Fan- other- I'm sorry, go ahead. No, no, go ahead. TT and Fangirl says, so wait, we might have some text text from Greasy or AC. And it's, it, well, it's not, it's. It's Greasebach, Coburn, and a third party, which we'll get to, which um, there was the part I was talking about that it is probably going to really complicate all of this to some other degree that I can't explain. I'm not a lawyer. It would take a Travis or you know, Cherie or someone that has experience in that, and we can comment about it, but I don't really know. It. But it it's definitely going to, I think, affect many things about the case. Jack, you, you know that Remember that Grace Buck asked for a one day extension today because he couldn't figure yep. out how to yep. e file it last night. Yeah, <laughs> I saw that. Yeah, so Cherie, be, keep your eye, your eyes peeled for tomorrow. Um, so that regardless. might be why we haven't gotten that. that you know. Yeah, yeah, he couldn't. He's filing at eleven forty last night, and he couldn't figure out how to do the the federal part of it. I I don't know. Whatever. And I see he's, Jennifer. He's, full of shit. he's stalling. That's that's what he's doing. He's stalling. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Hello, Jennifer Manning. Thanks for coming. Um, the uh, yeah. the the text message business is. Uh, I, I think we mentioned it before, but what was what was happening was Colburn was talking, you know, having meetings and stuff with his lawyers, and whatever they would tell him, he would immediately transmit to Transition Studios. So that's that's part of what all those text messages are um is everything all the advice and all the back and forth with brenda or sean or whoever at transition he was talking to 
Um, I, I think it's specifically and, Brenda. I'm not so sure that it was actually oh, transition. Really? Yeah, I don't think it's actually transition. Now, I don't know that for sure. You could be exactly right. It could be more than Brenda, but I don't know. Uh, Nanslau says, why did Coburn tell Remaker negative when De Remaker asked him if he got anything back on the plate? Coburn makes himself look involved or just stupid. Well, I can't disagree with that, Nans. Thanks for coming, by the way. And there's Anthony and D. Hello. Um, yeah, I mean, like Saprikov said, uh, Coburn had the, the plate and car information from two other sources prior the, to the plate call, the dispatch call. So it, it's perceived it's like, what the man or what the hell, man? Why are you calling? You've already got the information twice. Well, and here, here's another thing to think about. The, the other thing that leads me to believe that there was more to that call than he's trying to say is, why did they hide it from the defense? That there, was, there, there had to be a reason they didn't turn that over, and yeah. Remaker screwed that up. He did. That was, and that was in August. You know, we're, here we are, what, nine months later, ten months later, whatever, before the yeah. defense ever got those calls. So, okay. All right, let's, uh, let's get back to it. Um, and just for your reference, uh, Susan, we are on, this is, you know, document 240, number dash two, or under, underscore two. So I'm going to start with number five here. Interrogatory number five. Describe in detail all facts that you contend support your allegation in paragraph 64 of the second amended complaint and that challenged statement, quote, tended to harm you and uh, and actually and irrep irreparably harmed and damaged your reputation, lowering you in the estimation of the community and subjecting you to hostility, hatred, ridicule, and deterring third persons from associating or dealing with you, end quote. And the response, number five, Subject to plaintiff's general objections, plaintiff responds as follows. Plaintiff's counsel will be producing copies of numerous recorded voicemails that the plaintiff received from threatening and verbally abusing man viewers across the world, and plaintiff designates those documents in response to this interrogatory. Plaintiff's counsel will also be producing copies of email messages and online posts to the same effect. In addition, Plaintiffs will testify regarding the countless telephone calls that he received at his personal residence and at work that were not recorded due to the intense verbal abuse that plaintiffs suffered from the public at large following the MAM broadcast. Plaintiff eventually resigned from the Sheriff's Department earlier than intended. In addition, the effect of the abuse on the plaintiffs has continued to, demise, to the demise of plaintiff's marriage of multiple decades. Plaintiff also incorporates in this response his uh, in this response his response to the interrogatory number eight below. Damages are ongoing. Plaintiff reserves the right to supplement this response as discovery and investigation continues. So it's not only damages now, it's the damages that he could receive in the future. Is that what you guys got? Wait a minute. I, I thought I thought he dropped the whole bit about this being the cause for his divorce. Now he's changed his mind again? Apparently. I thought he dropped it too. And, 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 and he resigned from the sheriff's office because he tried to run for sheriff and lost. That's right. He says he, he resigned four years early. Um, I'm, I'm not, I can't remember when he hired in. It was early 90s or something. He was like, Part time, and then he, he finally made it a full time in, in in the jail. And when did he when did he leave? Yeah, like, that, was like, that was like a loss of four hundred thousand dollars. <throat> he was making good money. Yeah, damn good money. Yeah. I don't know what those guys make them all over time, but man, they must be paying the hell out of those guys. If it's four years, and that's four hundred thousand dollars. Wow. Yeah. I had no idea that MTSO had that kind of budget for their payroll. Holy shit. Yeah. 
I was surprised at that. I was making, uh, oh, I think I was at 23 or 24 bucks an hour as a deputy. Yeah, that's, I mean, you know, that's, you know, 30, 36, 38 bucks an hour on overtime. That's yeah, I mean, not bad. That's not bad money, you know. Yeah. But it's not 100,000. No, not, <laughs> not unless you just work at, not unless at least you just live there, you know. Yeah, okay. they must have been paying a boatload on overtime. I guess so. All right, interrogatory number six. For each of the challenge statements, describe in detail all facts that you contend support your allegation that the producer defendants published that challenge statement with knowledge of their falsity or reckless disregard of the truth or falsity. Response number six. Subject to plaintiff's general objections, plaintiff refers to the summaries attached in chart form here too. I don't think we have the chart either. Let me check this. No, nothing. I haven't seen it. Not attached either. Mm -mm. Okay, maybe that's somewhere else. All right, interrogatory number seven. For each material fact that you allege was omitted from the making of murder, State that om uh, omitted fact and describe in detail why you believe that the producer defendants had knowledge that omission of the fact would cause making a murder to be false or the producer defendants omitted the fact with reckless disregard of the serious truth or falsity. Response number seven. Subject to plaintiff's general objections, plaintiff refers to the summaries attached in chart form here to and to the allegations of the specific paragraphs of the second amended complaint that are described as, quote, challenged statements, end quote, as factual basis for many of the allegations is set forth therein, including detailed descriptions of the specific uh, alterations to and omissions of the trial testimony by the defendants. Defendant, defendants knew that the alter Alterations change the impact of the testimony, and it is evident that they made them for that reason, in order to continue to tell their story. This is further corroborated by the document produced production by Netflix, which demonstrate the involvement of the Netflix personnel in attempting to make the story more dramatic and to emphasize plaintiff as the alleged villain of the story. See plaintiff's responses to the first set of interrogatories of Netflix Incorporated. Discovery and investigation are ongoing, and plaintiff reserves the right to supplement his responses accordingly. Okay. Uh, number eight, interrogatory number eight. Describe in detail all items of damage you contend you sustained as a result of the reducer's defendant's acts of omission or alleged, or alleged in the second amended complaint. Response number eight. Subject to the, his general objections, plaintiff responds as follows. Making a murder damaged, if not destroyed, my reputation, my health, and my personal life. My reputation as a police officer, so important to maintain as trustworthy and being with integrity as well as honest, was severely damaged as millions viewed and believed the falsehood that making a murder. In the social media realm, my reputation was totally destroyed as I was and still am portrayed as a poster child for corruption. I began to fear this annihilation of my reputation would affect the weight of my courtroom testimony on other cases, effectively ruining my career as a police officer. My health was affected as I did and continue to live in a state of constant hypervigilance as making a murderer prompted a multitude of death threats to me and towards my family, never being able to totally relax as well as constantly anticipating an attack on me and or a member of my family has caused me to develop both hypertension and anxiety, which it has to be treated and with prescription medication. Due to the stress caused by ma'am, I have trouble sleeping and I find myself often angry and irritable. I no longer feel I can trust anyone totally ever again. My personal life has also been greatly damaged as a result of ma'am. My inability to go back to the person I was before ma'am has destroyed my 30-year marriage, and the marriage ended in divorce. I have uh, lost family members and friends because of ma'am's false narrative, reckless agenda, and betrayal of me, which is only exacerbated by the social media crazies who continually, seven years after its release, claim that I am a corrupt, evil person 
that man is truthful. I am often confronted by total strangers who inform me that they despise me for, quote, what I have done, end quote, regarding Stephen Avery. I am not allowed to be present at any media event at my current employer as my presence could be disruptive. Wow. How were the social media crazies? <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, there, there were, I mean, I don't really know personally about him. Of course, we did witness, uh, you know, back in the early days when Man was first released, there were some some serious nut bags that got loose and, well, he's yeah. just saying that people that are still to this day claiming that he's corrupt and and man was truthful. You know, honestly, I, I, I mean, we see it from time to time, but I really haven't seen much of anything really about him too much uh, in the social media. And I think we're all on it pretty much off and on all day, you know. I think my well, big problem is I can slip yeah. YouTube social media. Is it not? Say that again, Susan. I said I consider YouTube social media. Is it oh, not? Oh, absolutely it is. Yeah. Yeah. The problem that I have, yeah, the problem that I have is it's like, he says it's a fake narrative, but it's not the narrative that the filmmakers are putting out. This is the narrative that the lawyers are creating. And so as long as the filmmakers within reason are just, documenting what the lawyers are going after or what people players in the case are going after he really doesn't have much to go on because they're not they didn't go outside the bounds i mean if you i know that we're only talking about ma'am two but in ma'am one you know they're pointing that the lawyers are pointing the finger at him and Lank. the lawyers are doing that not the filmmakers editing it to make it look like he might be dirty they're saying no we believe you planted evidence and so i just don't know how they can how he thinks he has a case i just find this all to be frivolous but let's you know that's just me that's just where where i'm at with it or maybe that's my hope <laughs> my desire but i mean just imagine if all the people that ever got caught in the public eye and had bad and had bad press could just sue whoever put that out there. Like, it doesn't work that way. That's that's how I see it. I may be proved wrong, but that's how I see it. And something I found really interesting the other day was Mark Codnott's um, um, interview with uh, Richard Mahler. Yeah. And Richard Mahler said after, you know, when they went into um, uh, deliberations that, he felt, and I'm not sure if he said others felt, but he felt at that time that uh, Andy was lying on the stand and he wasn't credible at all. So that was to the jury or after the trial. It had nothing to do with Netflix or, you know, man that came out 11 years later or whatever it was. He said he was sweating and he just, you know, he just didn't believe him. So... I mean, he gave that impression. It, you know, it didn't take Netflix to do it. Well, well yeah, yeah. 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 what's up? And it didn't take the documentary either, because all, all you, you know, if you want to work proof, all you had to do was look at his depositions from the '85 case. I, I, I watched that and I said that guy's full of shit. Right. And that wasn't a that wasn't from a documentary. That wasn't from you know some some editing. Right. <laughs> right? Yeah, and, you and know. not only that, but Go ahead, he, he would have to he would have to prove that people like us are only going off of the the limited footage in the documentary to determine our position on whether he's he has integrity or not, and he's going to lose on that because, as we all know, Bam Bam is way in the past. We're way beyond that. Uh, our yeah. all of our thoughts and and things about Colburn have been further formed by their own reports by the 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 testimony itself via the transcripts all of that so and i lack, actually think that case and lack of reports that we can't forget that yeah and cover did another Mueller, well, yeah 
just saying how he felt about Colburn after at the end of the trial. Well, if they call him for a deposition, that's possible. I that's think where, he would be helpful. Uh, that might be worth a suggestion uh, to Lita. I've thought of that, yeah. Yeah, Hot, well, hot, hot, hot would have to contact Netflix's folks and let them know. Yeah, I mean, uh, that's interesting, but, you know, we can't forget about the lack of report. You know, it, the visit that uh, Remaker and, and uh, when the, it was Remaker and uh, Coburn that went out there on the 3rd or the 4th, whenever it was, and a report wasn't written until August, except July of August. Yeah. So right. on top of that, one other factoid, we can't forget about the key and what happened with the key. Link, Coburn, right. Kacharski. Yeah. <laughs> and the key sitting in a tree Cobra or Kratz bring <laughs> yeah, I, I did you know, that, that was a rhyme and I really didn't wasn't even thinking about it, but that, that's pretty damn good. Um and then Kratz, Colburn's email about the key. Well, not only that, but Colburn or Kratz in his closing asked the jury to forget about it. Just ignore the key. Can't right. we just can't right. we just ignore it after he has these three guys testify about it? God, man. <laughs> and, So. I did my headphones. Theory Sorry. that the prosecution. I'm, I'm not sure. I was going to ask this question, uh, maybe in a in a bigger conversation. But like, it seems like Kratz and his in in his narrative is well. If we didn't get the story right, Stephen Avery's probably still did it. So just just go along with this here. Like, yeah, he's he's, 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 like, he's guilty of something. He's guilty of something, right? So let's just put him away. I think it's such an important point because it, that's not what justice is, not predetermining outcomes, right? It's like uh, the, you know, the FBI agent, I forget his name, the one who tested the swabs. He's like, oh, yeah, I tested the swabs, the one that the MTSO sent me. Like, but, and, and so that, but, but so that makes you say that it didn't come from the, you didn't test the, the source material. You tested what was handed to you. And it was like you're not you're just making guesses about evidence now. You're not actually um, collecting it yourself. Evidence. Yeah, collecting same it yourself. Thing. Right. This is the same thing. It's like, well, it's probably I believe it to be true. So if we didn't get the story right, if actually none of the details in our story make any sense, Stephen Avery still did it. So you should convict. And I think that that's that's the dangerous uh, way that Kratz kind of angled in. I mean, yep, I don't disagree. Okay. Um, let me just check here. I should have looked. We got any questions, comments? Um, I see Dr. Sutwin's, uh, he, he actually DM'd me. He's got running errands. Um, Dr. Sutwin says, ma'am was shown years after the fact. And Stephen and Brendan were sent to prison. Coburn made himself look bad and had zip to do with ma'am. That's true. Uh, ma'am, you know, for dramatic effect or not, it had no, it had zero effect on what happened in 2005 through 2007. Nothing at all. You know, you know, it's easy to lose sight of that. Kind of like you're there, you know, we were all during this, you know, we got to witness what happened in the, the, the her depth thing. You know, we were all had our heads stuck up in it. This is completely different with ma'am. You know, that was the legal stuff was done. And, you know, whatever for dramatic effect, it's in you know, Sapricop talked about this a few weeks ago. We were talking about this stuff and he explained it very well. It absolutely had nothing to do with any of it at all. So. OK, let's uh, let's march forward. We're on number nine, interrogatory number nine for each item of damage damages that you identified in interrogatory number eight identify the amount of damages that you are claiming and your method for calculating such response number nine subject to his general objections plaintiff responds as follows the damage to my reputation prompted me to retire from law enforcement four years earlier than i had wanted to costing me about at least 400 grand 
the value of the damage to my personal life, the destruction of my marriage, and the loss of friends and family, personal health and well-being, sense of calm and sense of safety and security, and the general damage to my reputation. I'm requesting... I am requesting be determined, that didn't sound right, be determined at the trial by jury. In my personal opinion, a value of a million dollars per episode of MAM 1 and 2 will not even cover the loss of personal happiness caused by the defendants. Yet defendants have undoubtedly been enriched by at least that amount through what they took from me. For fuck's sake. 400 grand, four years, man, he's making some serious cash there. Unless he's making and some cash. a million cash. dollars per yeah. episode. What, 20 episodes, right? So 20 million is the least he thinks it's valued at. Yeah, that's, uh, that, that's, I, I doubt that a jury would give him that if he was to win. Uh, yeah. yeah. All right, interrogatory number 10. Identify all persons with knowledge of the facts relating to the damages that you described in interrogatory number 8. And the substance of each person's knowledge. Response number 10. Subject to his general objections, plaintiff responds as follows. I have discussed the facts of the damages detailed in my response to interrogatory number eight with very few people due to my newfound inability to trust anyone. I have disclosed those damages to my health care providers and to the law firms who represent me in this suit. I've also disclosed how ma'am damaged me personally to the law firm representing me in my divorce case. I have further disclosed how ma'am caused me damage to the producers of the upcoming documentary entitled Convicting a Murderer during the interviews with them. Beyond that, I rarely, if ever, discuss how ma'am caused me damages. I instead only defend myself, my fellow deputies, my former agency, and law enforcement in general when asked or confronted about Netflix or the producers of MAM or MAM itself. Interrogatory number 11, identify every health care provider that you have uh, seen for treatment of any conditions that you believe were caused by exasper or exasperated by making a murderer, and for each, describe the nature of the symptoms for which you sought treatment, the diagnosis you received, and all medications you were prescribed, and all treatments and therapy you received, and the dates of the treatments and, the, and therapy. Response number 11. Subject to his general objections, Plaintiff designates his previously produced health care records in response to this interrogatory without waiving the confidentiality designations in said prior production, which are incorporated by reference herein. Plaintiff further responds that he has seen the following providers that he has seen for anxiety related to the effects of ma'am. Teresa J. Krujernjic, NP of, of Previa on December 28, 2018, noted as having, quote, prevented for, in quote, anxiety. Follow-up on June 28, 2019, plaintiff has taken um, abuse prone thus far as a result of his anxiety caused by ma'am. I don't know. I've never heard of those two. Uh, plaintiff believes that the stress is also adversely suffering his, adversely affecting his blood pressure for which he takes the center peril. I've taken that. Damages are ongoing and plaintiff reserves the right to supplement his, this response. As to objections dated this 28th day of January, 2022. And law firm of, there we go. All right. And then this next one is 240-3. And we get into some, I think, uh, some more interesting things here. In fact, I'm going to close well, some, let me close some of these windows here. Go ahead and talk. I'm going to close this out for a second. Go ahead. Okay. One of the, so one, whatever... Whatever Colburn's lawyers are telling him, they've at least smartly let him know that the proper way to go about this is the pain and mental anguish side of things, because that is almost impossible to defend against. Um, as, as anybody who, who's ever been sued or party to a suit where, where that's been involved, pain and mental anguish almost always tends to win in, in a lot of respects. 
Um, so keep that in mind. I think it is a good thread for him, you know, the law, on the law side of it to go after that. It does make sense because if you do have, uh, you know, a trail of medical, um, you know, you know, things that you sought medical treatment for. But I just think, like, you're a 63-year-old man and you're blaming your high blood pressure on a documentary. Right. I, You know, it's, it's hard to be like, well, no, that you definitely would have never had high blood pressure and had stress had this documentary not come out. I find that hard a hard one to swallow. And you're, you're, you lost, you, you're, you didn't want to work anymore and your relationships fell apart. Like, how do we know that that's not on you? You know what I mean? How do we know that that's not your, excuse me, horrible personality that, you know, your wife doesn't want to be with you or that, you're, you know, the career thing didn't pan out? To blame that on a documentary? Snowflake much? No. It... Yabba <laughs> bean. What's that, sir? I was going to say, just, just the job of, of being in law enforcement can also have a lot of those negative side effects. There you sure. go. Exactly. Sure. Especially, you know, I'm, I wouldn't necessarily think so in a, a smaller city county like Manitoba, but, you know, you get into the bigger, you know, uh, police forces in New York and, and all that. Yeah, I'm sure the job stress can be pretty intense. So, and isn't Coburn's... Uh, well, ex-wife now, isn't she legally blind? It, do I remember that right? Oh, yeah. I don't know. Legally blind, yeah. Yeah. All right, uh, Susan, are you, uh, you want to read a little bit? You want to read Exhibit 11? <clears throat> sure. And you know what? These are those emails, Jack. So um, it starts at the bottom. That's kind of how they go. Um, All right, I'll scroll down and I'll, I'll scroll down and we can go up. So the first one is um, Brenda writing, I believe, to Grease Bot. Um, Let's see. Are you ready? It says, hi there. I wanted to send over what I had so far. Yep, got it. Okay. Hi there. I wanted to send over what I had so far. This is one part with Tyson and Kaharski that you may want to change since the babysitting comment is with Tyson referring to the 11.5 initial search. And the prior part is the November 8th search with Kaharski. My personal feeling is that part is not strong enough to consider an example of deceptive editing. Since the question they pulled Tyson's splice from is very similar and follow-up question to the babysitting one. Just my thoughts. Please let, let me know if you have a question so far. I'll send an update when I get more done. And the next one is, uh, that was December 10th, 2018. Yep. At 11.31 a.m. Next one is 11.35 a.m. from Brenda. Note there are comments for many many of the suggestions so you can just hover over them to see why and then at let's see 12 11 p.m greasebach writes back to brenda thanks brenda i appreciate your filing filling in the dates and number of years etc and i agree with most of your thoughts unfortunately i've also made edits in the last few days but I'll compare my edits with yours and go from there. Attached is the revised draft of the first claim for relief, defamation of character. The claims themselves are not lengthy because they adopt by reference the facts as already stated in the body of the complaint. However, they are where the case rises and falls under the law. I hope to have the other two claims, intentional infliction, of emotional stress and negligence finish late today. Uh, best to you both. Let's go slay some dragons. Okay. And then Brenda writes back at 1229. 
less than a half hour later. Thanks, Mike. This is a big project and it's looking really great. Nice job. Should I not continue on with the rest of the pages if you had have made updates already? Doesn't really make sense if you have an updated version and I'm updating an old one. Is the whole thing due on the 11th or just the three claims? I think I have other examples of editing in MAM to make Colburn look sketchy. That could be included if you wish, but may not work if the entire doc is due on the 11th. So Michael writes back to Brenda. Uh, it doesn't have to be filed until 1218, three years after MAM's release, but I don't want to wait till then. I'm shooting for Wednesday. We'll, we'll obviously be speaking with Andy before anything is filed. We still have some things to decide, including whether to bring Farak in now or implead him and the others in later. I'm inclined to not further complicate this right now. There's plenty of time to bring him in. Andy and I will also coordinate the timing of filing, serving the defendants, and preparing a media release. I know we have lots to talk about, Andy, but let us let me get the complaint finished first. I agree with you, Brenda, that it makes more sense for you to wait to edit until you have the final version of each section of the complaint. I've attached a final revised draft of the emissions and distortion section if you want to review. If you have additional significant instances of ma'am lies, we could probably still work them in, but it's not essential since we're not limited going forward to what we included in the complaint. On the other hand, we want to wow them as much as we can. Use your discretion. Thanks. That's interesting. Yeah, that was carbon copied to Andy. Let's see. And the first one is just uh, that. Is that Colburn's wife, Barb? Is this correspondent? Is this correspondence from Brenda Schuler? Yes. yes. It's between Brenda Griefstock oh. and Andy was carbon copied on that That's one. What I said earlier we're going to get to that. She, she helped them write the complaint, the original complaint. Wow. Yeah, yeah, that's exactly why I said earlier. I don't know. I'm not I'm not lawyerly enough to say what this means, but doesn't this completely destroy attorney client privilege between Coburn and Greasebach? Uh, it, it ruins attorney client privilege and it completely destroys any of that reporter's privilege crap. Right, Thank exactly. You. Thank you. Yeah, whatever they want. Well, We're working on this as pages. So much for transition studios. So much for transition studios. Uh, latest tweets. We're transparent and unbiased. Huh. I haven't seen those. Yeah, right. Oh yeah, the tweets. Yeah, yeah, I, I did see them, and um, Saprakov had many good tweet comments. Actually, really good. Yeah, you know, I th I think they probably did that because of these emails. So, and so, who was it? Be uh, say that again. So, I think it's probably they did that recently because of these emails that are to be released. Um, well, I, I I tweeted I tweeted at them after we did the live on the uh, on the hearing. The oral and, arguments, yeah. Uh, I tweeted and said, "Well, so much for your so much for your quote unquote unbiased um, lying documentary." <laughs> <laughs> and then they they finally responded. Uh, well, it was just a couple of days ago when they when they first started responding, and then uh, Temptedious jumped in there and took because they 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 tweeted out several articles, and Temptedious jumped in and ripped apart those articles, tweeting back to him. And then they shut up. Well, the article that that first one I think I looked at it was from 2016, right? Isn't that right? Yeah, the 2016 or 2017. Yeah, yeah. It's a ridiculously old article that you know we're we're light years ahead from then. I mean, my God. <laughs> and yes, uh, I'm not sure who asked the question, but it does look like this is Coburn's uh, hotmail account, Coburn's wife. 
or X Life now. So yeah, yeah. That, this Be exhibit, open. yeah, this this exhibit eleven is a uh, that says. I mean, to me, it man, it it, uh, it blows a, a lot of stuff apart. Anyway, we'll move on to document two forty one. And this one's 12 pages. Uh, Susan, do you have time to read this or feel like reading it? Or if, you, if not, I can, or we can trade sure. off, whatever. Uh, All right. I'll start it, Jack. Yep. <laughs> this is a uh, Grace Box supplement, supplemental brief on Netflix motion to compel compliance with its subpoena. Do I have the right one? You do. Okay. The court directed the parties to file simultaneous supplemental briefs explaining the impact of Wisconsin's reporter privilege, including any applicable waiver of the privilege, on Netflix's motion to compel. Oh, just just the pause, reason. just just pause for one second. And what sure. this is this is referring to is the judge toward the end of that oral argument, he instructed them uh, both parties to submit further breeze, blah, 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 whatever, um, in the coming week. And this is what this is. That's what he's referring to. Go ahead. Right. Okay. Uh, the respondent wishes to clarify at the outset that the reporter privilege is the basis for his objection to document requests number one through six, only docket 207 uh, EXH. What's that stand for? One. No, the exhibit one. Uh, Oh, exhibit one, duh. Uh, February 9, 2022, subpoena to Mike Griesbach. The respondents' objections to the remaining requests are based on other grounds that have been argued at length in the party's briefs and will not be repeated here. As an additional preliminary matter, the respondent does not understand Netflix to be challenging that he is a, quote, news person under Wisconsin's reporter privilege statute. As noted in respondents' brief in opposition, uh, included within the definition of, quote, news person in Wisconsin Statute 885.1411B is any person who is or has been engaged in gathering, receiving, preparing, or disseminating news or information to the public for an entity described in paragraph A. Quote, uh, let's see, among the entities enumerated in paragraph A are, quote, book publishers. Thus, the respondent falls neatly under the definition of a news person, and Netflix has not claimed otherwise. Number one, Netflix failed to meet the strict procedural and substantive requirements in Wisconsin's reporter privilege statute to compel disclosure. The procedure for subpoenaing a news reporter in Wisconsin is markedly different than that for subpoenaing anyone else. Only a court can issue a subpoena to a news reporter, and only after the person requesting the subpoena has met a rigorous showing justifying why disclosure should be compelled. Wisconsin Statute 885.142 provides in relevant part to Subpoenas issued to news persons. A. Prohibition. Except as provided in paragraph B, no person having the power to issue a subpoena may issue a subpoena compelling a news person to testify about or produce or disclose any of the following that is obtained or prepared by the news person in the news person's capacity in gathering, receiving, or preparing news or information for potential dissemination to the public. B, procedure before courts. Subject to paragraph C, a circuit court may issue a subpoena to compel a news person to testify about or disclose or produce any news, information, or identity of any sources specified in paragraph A. Four, if the court finds after notice to and an opportunity to be heard by the news person. Netflix ignored this statutorily mandated procedure by subpoenaing the respondent directly without making application to the court. 
that the subpoena also requested non-privileged documents is not a reasonable excuse, and the respondent is unaware of any cases suggesting otherwise. Moreover, Netflix would be hard-pressed to claim ignorance of the requirement since one of its lawyers in this action has written extensively on Wisconsin's reporter privilege, including its stringent statutory procedural requirements. A footnote one, <clears throat> Wisconsin's reporter privilege compendium, James A. Friedman and Max Ted Lenz, Godfrey and Kahn, SC. Procedures for issuing and contesting subpoenas. The shield law imposes rigid requirements before a subpoena can be issued to a member of the news media. For non-confidential information, a subpoena compelling a news person to testify about, disclose, or produce any news, information, or source can be issued only by a circuit court, not an attorney. And Netflix's failure involves more than procedural error. To subpoena a news reporter in Wisconsin, the applicant for the subpoena must, by clear and convincing evidence, <clears throat> establish the following four criteria. Number one, the news information or identity of the source is highly relevant to the investigation, prosecution, action, or proceeding. Number two, the news information or identity of the source is necessary to the maintenance of a party's claim, defense, or to the proof of an issue material to the investigation, prosecution, action, or proceeding. Number three, the news information or identity of the source is not obtainable from any alternative source for the investigation, prosecution, action, or proceeding. And number four, there is an overriding public interest in the disclosure of the news information or identity of the source. Wisconsin Statute 885.142CC. Rather than trying to meet these proofs, Netflix repeatedly, but wrongly, insists that the federal general rules of discovery apply, going so far as to represent that, quote, thus the only issue for this court is to, to, to determine is whether the subpoenaed materials meet the broad standard of relevance in discovery. And it's no wonder that Netflix mischaracterizes the applicable standard for it cannot meet the stringent criteria to overcome the privilege set forth in the reporter's privilege statute. Having scoured the 540 pages of text in the respondent's book, Netflix cites a handful of inconsequential excerpts and then commands the respondent to turn over a myriad of privileged documents. In none of these citations does Netflix come close to meeting 885.14's rigorous standards to compel disclosure. <clears throat> Second footnote says, among the documents Netflix demands with respect to the respondent's books are the following. All documents drafted in connection with the books, whether formal or informal, outlines, treatments, drafts, and final manuscripts, marketing and promotion information, and communications with the respondent's agent. Uh, first, Netflix points to respondents recounting in one of his books a conversation he overheard among coffee shop patrons concerning their impressions of the Avery trial as proof that he possesses relevant information about damage to Mr. Colburn's reputation before making a murder aired. Netflix would be hard pressed to prove, as they must under 885.142b2c, that the coffee shop patrons' opinions are highly relevant and necessary for its defense, or that it can't obtain similar information from alternative sources, or especially that an, uh, quote, overriding public interest, unquote, requires disclosure of the patrons' names or other information the respondent might have about them. Similarly, the fact that one of Mr. Coburn's colleagues was upset that a police officer, police officer probably falsely accused of planting evidence by a criminal defense lawyer 
during trial has little if any legal recourse. Docket 206, motion to compel, page 14. Is neither, quote, highly relevant, relevant or necessary for Netflix's defense. Nor is there any overriding public interest in the disclosure of the officer's frustration. The same holds true for respondents sharing with readers that, quote, the quirky circumstances of the investigation scared him, especially how Colburn and Link were the ones to find the keys, end quote. And that the prosecutor's attempts to, quote, soften the blow, end quote, of that evidence, uh, quote, rang hollow to many. What happened here? Oh, there we go. Sorry. <clears throat> Netflix can surely find other observers of Mr. Avery's trial who were inclined to believe the police planted evidence to frame him. Indeed, they have. Uh, Docket 84, Attachments, Exhibit 1, Second Amended Complaint, page 36 and 37, Excerpts from Making a Murderer, Episode 3, depicting a number of Manitowoc County bar patrons expressing their opinion that the police framed Mr. Avery. The same is true for the respondent, opining in one of his books that the police officers, quote, looked more defensive during their depositions than they should have if they had nothing to hide, unquote. Netflix can make the point without resorting to subpoenaing one of the plaintiff's lawyers. The final book excerpt cited by Netflix that either Mr. Colburn or one of his colleagues hopes for a peaceful Christmas day were dashed by telephone calls from angry viewers of making a murderer. It's the least compelling of all. If the respondent was referring to Mr. Colburn, Netflix argues, quote, this statement obviously undermines Mr. Colburn's claim that making a murderer destroyed his marriage, unquote. Aside from the logic of the in inference, Netflix is more than capable of digging into the demise of Mr. Colburn's marriage in other ways. Having come up woefully short in the excerpts it cites, Netflix cannot meet its statutory burden by simply claiming, as it does in its reply brief, that, quote, the examples discussed in the motion to compel were just that were just that examples and are not the only proof that the respondent has relevant discoverable materials unquote uh, Wisconsin statute requires more than self-serving speculation and Netflix has come up woefully short despite these fundamental procedural and substantive errors in the interest of judicial economy and in acknowledgement that both parties have made procedural missteps, the respondent does not seek relief on the basis of Netflix, Netflix's procedural, albeit serious error. Do you wanna discuss, Jack? Uh, um, yeah, I mean, I mean, we're kind of going through, uh, I think much of, what's already been kind of covered um and then I, I did, it seems I, to me like they've been over the same stuff like a million times i don't know but, is it just me or no it does and but they're you know they're they're calling us um let's see we're on page we're on we're, we're starting approaching number two let me back for just they're making this a song what did they call it they call a news a news person. That's what they're saying here on page one, They're challenging that he is a news person. Um, and I, I guess they're talking about and, and talking about Wisconsin reporter privilege, and that's completely shattered now with that exhibit eleven we just read. I mean, to me, it is. I, I, again, I'm not a lawyer, so. But aren't right. they're, they're trying to refer to or uh, Greasebox trying to uh, defend himself with saying that. He's a news person, which in fact I, I I don't see that. No matter how Wisconsin's statute is written, I just don't see it. I don't either. Sh shall I go on? Um, like well, 
Yo, Jeff, you got something? I, I kind of do have something, and it's it's related to this, but it's it's uh, I was poking around and searching about some things in the background, and I thought, um, you know, how does guilt manifest itself? Because guilt can manifest itself in a physical way. And um, I found this website, Better Health, which people know about it, and this is a reputable article written by a, a mental health expert. And I'll read it to you, but basically, before I read it to you, I'm going to tell you, everything that Colburn is claiming are symptoms of guilt. High blood pressure and anxiety, right? Absolutely. So Sleepless, the, sleeplessness? Go ahead, Jeff. The most known organs intentionally or internally affected by guilt is the brain. The brain is known as the powerhouse of processing our thoughts, feelings, and emotions. Therefore, excessive or automatic thoughts that manifest in guilt... Can have very exhausting can be very exhausting mentally, which can cause the brain to work harder, and process thoughts, feelings, and emotions in regard to how we reasonably be able to process the effects of this guilt. And then lastly, it says when individuals feel emotionally or mentally guilty, the ultimate effects of guilt can cause an individual's everyday habits, relationships work duties and or responsibilities to be greatly affected so if i'm the netflix lawyer i'm saying all those boxes that you're ticking colburn could be exactly because of your guilt and i think right there you would create reasonable doubt with a jury yeah. very interesting Jeff. and true yeah and true yeah absolutely boom uh. Done. Done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It looks like Supper Cop had to take off. Probably, you know. Um, okay. I didn't really see anything in the chat. Uh, let me check one more time. Make sure I didn't miss anything. I see Kristen D has joined us. Hello, Kristen Bell. 43D, thanks for coming. Somebody else, too. Uh, Anthony Hills. Hello. There's our William, Colette, there's Jazz Naz, so, some of them jazz hands. And uh, let's see, uh, Kelly, Kelly McAllen, thanks for coming. And um, yeah, okay. Yep, I think we're good to go. You can continue on with uh, the next, next bit. Okay. Number two. The court should not deem the respondent waived the protection afforded him under Wisconsin's reporter privilege statute by his noncompliance with Rule 45 of the Federal Civil Rules of Procedure. <clears throat> Netflix argues the respondent waived his privilege claim by not including it in his written objections and by not describing the nature of the withheld documents as required by Federal R Civil P 45E2A. While conceding his error, the respondent submits for the reason stated below that the court should not deem the privilege waived. Even though I didn't follow the rules, <laughs> while yeah. violations of Rule 45 of the Federal Rules of Civil Procedure can result in waiver, waiver is not required. As the court stated in First Savings Bank, FSB versus First Bank Systems, Inc., um, a, a quote, acknowledging the harshness of a waiver sanction, courts have reserved the sanction for those cases where the offending party committed unjustified delay in responding to discovery. Minor procedural violations, good faith attempts at compliance, and other such mitigating circumstances uh, militate against finding waiver. Uh, the Seventh Circuit has stated that, quote, discovery sanctions may only be imposed where a party displays willfulness, bad faith, or fault, unquote. More pointedly, quote, when the disclosing party raises an untimely objection on the grounds of privilege, courts have noted that waiver is particularly severe. Courts have considered four factors when deciding whether to sanction discovery violations. Number one, the prejudice or surprise to the party against whom the evidence is being offered. 
Number two, the ability of the party to cure the prejudice. Number three, the likelihood of disruption to the trial. And number four, the bad faith or willful, willfulness involved in not disclosing evidence at an earlier date. Here, Netflix has not been prejudiced by the late privilege objections. Although not raised in the initial responses, Netflix was apprised of the privilege issues during a meet and confer prior to bringing its motion to compel. Uh, see Griesbach's declaration, paragraph one through four. The delay is relatively brief in the context of the lengthy time period Mr. Colburn's case has been pending and it will not cause prejudice or disruption of the trial. Discovery is still open, and with this issue thoroughly briefed by the parties, it will soon be resolved. Finally, and perhaps most significantly, there is no evidence that the respondent's procedural error was made in bad faith, and Netflix does not appear to argue otherwise. Even if a technical waiver would ordinarily result, the respondent's failure to comply with Rule 45 involves constitutional considerations, which require special considerations militating against waiver. Courts within the Seventh Circuit have recognized that waiver may be relieved if constitutional concerns are present. Uh, Appleton Papers, Inc. versus George A. Whiting Paper Company. Uh, let's see, quote, where a constitutional privilege is involved, a trial court possesses the discretion not to find waiver. Although courts have stated that constitutional privileges are not inherently self-executing, waiver of constitutional rights are, quote, not lightly to be inferred, unquote. Impact v. United States, uh, 1955, discussing waiver of Fifth Amendment. Further, quote, courts must indulge every reasonable presumption against waiver, unquote. U.S. versus O. Henry's Filmworks, Inc. Although these cases do not directly address the reporter privilege, arguably all constitutional privileges are subject to a heightened standard due to the nature of the underlying right and its importance. Boy, that's a weak point. <laughs> Big time. <laughs> Further, the respondent's procedural error should not result in waiver when Netflix ignored the more fundamental requirements set forth in Wisconsin's reporter privilege statute. As explained in section one about, a party seeking to subpoena a news reporter must apply to a court and prove the requisite criteria enumerated under Wisconsin statute 885.14 by clear and convincing evidence before a valid subpoena is issued. Having chosen not to comply with the statutorily mandated procedure, Netflix is not in a position to complain about the respondent's, relatively speaking, more minor procedural error. <laughs> the respondent is unaware of case law, identifying the proper remedy for failure to comply with 88514. But other technical deficiencies have been held to invalidate a subpoena. Let's see. This quote is determining that a subpoena with the incorrect district in the heading was invalid and denying a motion to compel based on invalidity. And this site holding that technical failure to include witness fee or mileage check invalidates the subpoena. Netflix failure to comply with 885142-2 to apply to the court and meet the statutory criteria to subpoena the respondent is a significantly more fundamental deficiency than the minor technical errors held to invalidate subpoenas in the cases cited above. Logic provides no reason why Netflix more serious errors should be treated differently. Additionally, as indicated above, oops, Netflix failed to respond in its motion to compel despite being notified of the respondent's privilege claim at the meet and confer. Courts have held that arguments raised for the first time in a reply brief are waived. 
Still worse, and as also explained above, Netflix chose to apply an inapplicable standard of relevance in its reply brief rather than correct the standard set forth in 88514. Uh, under all these circumstances, Netflix's insistence that the respondent should be held to strict compliance while it should be relieved of its more fundamental error is clearly unwarranted. I'm going to let you continue, Jack. Yeah, okay. I just wanted to say that pretty much everything in that section two seemed really weak to me. Really weak. Very weak. I agree. Okay. They're just they're just grabbing at straws here. That's what it sounds like. Yeah, I, because I I just need to point out from the comments, like I said, reasonable doubt, and they're like, reasonable doubt isn't in a civil case. Okay, so maybe that term's not used, but let's be clear: this is a jury that's going to see this, correct? So, your whether it's a criminal case or not, or they use that term, reasonable doubt or they don't use the term reasonable doubt. I don't think that's the point. The point is that if you come after Colburn and say, these are the symptoms of guilt, they're gonna go, the jury's gonna go, oh, that's, now you can use the word reasonable doubt or you can use a different term if you want, but that's the point. And I think it's really nitpicky to kind of poke at my words. And I don't think that that's a constructive thing for this, for this open mic, but I appreciate what you're trying to say, but I think you're missing the point vastly when I when I when you break down my statement like that. That's all I want to say. Thank you. Well, yeah, I mean, there's you know reasonableness. Uh, I get what you're saying. Whatever. I, I do. I, I get. I, I get what I, I get what you're saying. I, I didn't. I didn't see that. I understood what you said. I just wanted to, the I just wanted to point it out. I think it's important that we stay on track, and we just start to derail the the train here with minting words over the legalese terminology right so that's all i have to say i just wanted to address that okay i understand and i, I didn't you know I, I didn't take any issue with i, I understood your context and what you said so um yeah okay let's let's continue forward number three the respondent did not weigh the the protection afforded him by the Wisconsin Reporter Privilege Statute by agreeing to represent Mr. Colburn. And as Susan said, they have repeated this ad nauseum. And personally, I don't see the Reporter Privilege applying to him at all. I just don't. But anyway, Wisconsin Statute 885.14.1444 provides as follows. The disclosure to another person or dissemination to the public of news, information, or the identity of a source as described in sub, and it goes on there, 2A1 to 4, by a news person does not constitute a waiver of the protection from a compelled disclosure under sub 2 or 3. The respondent is unaware of any case law in Wisconsin interpreting this provision. As such, the court must apply Wisconsin law and attempt to predict how the Wisconsin Supreme Court would rule on this issue. And they sought State Farm Fire and Casualty Company versus Amazon.com. Well, that's interesting. And I will try to read this smaller print here and in uh, this footnote number three. Uh, they're citing Prince uh, V. Cato, and it cites the case number there. Um, in the reply brief, defendants also insist that Prince waived his current objections by failing to object to the defendant's original subpoena to IDOC within the time frame specified in Rule 45D 2B. This argument is raised for the first time in his reply brief and is waived. And there's another citing there. Uh, arguments raised for the first time in reply brief are waived. Continuing, Wisconsin, um, uh, it's another cited case. When engaging in statutory interpretation, the courts must follow the framework provided by the Wisconsin Supreme Court in 
Kalal State uh, X Rail Kalal V Circuit Court for Dane. Um, I guess that's Dane County. Uh, under this framework, statutory interpretation begins with an, ex an examination of the plain meaning of the statutory language in which each term is given its common, ordinary, and accepted meaning. Where the plain language is unambiguous and the analysis ends and other extraneous sources are not to be consulted. 885144 expressly states that disclosure to another person does not amount to a waiver. <clears throat> okay. The statute does not facilitate, though, but facially place any qualifications on, quote, another person may or may not be. Instead, the statute is worded to protect disclosure to any other person, regardless of the relationship between the reporter and the person. The statute contains nothing to suggest that the respondent's communications to Mr. Grease or Mr. Colburn or co-counsel are precluded. Instead, it broadly precludes waiver where information is disclosed, is disclosed to, quote, another person. Additionally, Wisconsin's anti-waiver protection applies to disclosures made by, quote, news persons, which is also broadly stat statutorily defined and includes, quote, any person who is or has been engaged in gathering, receiving news or information to the public. End quote. Wisconsin Statute 885141B, emphasis added, as such, the statute clearly contemplates protection for news persons who previously engaged in news reporting activities, even if they are arguably not currently acting in that capacity. This distinction is crucial because in the case relied upon by Netflix, Simon v. Northwestern University, the court largely took issue with the reporter acting in another capacity that of lawyer. Unlike Illinois, Wisconsin statute saw fit to create a broad anti-waiver provision, which it applies to news reporters when they make disclosures to another person, even if they are not currently engaged in news reporting. But no, number four, quote, this case is not federal court on the basis of diversity, diversity jurisdiction, so the court applies to the law of the former, of the forum state. Wisconsin. And if Wisconsin law is unclear, the court must predict how Wisconsin Supreme Court would decide the issue, end quote. Uh, no statutory language indicates that the disclosure to a client is different than the protected disclosure to another person. Ignoring Wisconsin's statutory, quote, anti-waiver position provision, Netflix relies instead on an Illinois district court decision. Simon v. Northwestern University. The Simon is distinguishable both legally and factually. The text of the Illinois reporter, reporter's privilege is materially different than Wisconsin's. While Illinois has codified its own version of the reporter's shield statute, it cites it there, nothing in its statute addresses waiver. In fact, courts in the Northern District of Illinois have expressly noted that, quote, the statute is silent on the question of whether a reporter may waive the privilege by her conduct, and the case law addre addressing the question is sparse, end quote. The facts in Simon are distinguishable as well. In Simon, the court determined that a news reporter, in this case, a, docu a, document a documentarian who became a counsel for a party in, the, in this litigation, waived protection under Illinois' reporter privilege. Although a cursory review suggests the case is factually similar in an in-depth analysis reveals several significant distinguishing facts. The attorney in Simon, a Mr. Hale, was far more involved in the underlying legal dispute than the respondent who was in this case. Hale and his team's investigation included jailhouse interviews and other investigative techniques far beyond the research the respondent conducted in preparation for writing his books. Hell's documentary, quote, A Murder in the Park, ultimately led to the release of Mr. Steinman, who 
who had been convicted of murder after falsely confessing to the crime. While the respondent, while the respondents has become embroiled in the controversy surrounding Mr. Avery's murder investigation by virtue of authoring some books, his efforts had no effect in the outcome of Avery's conviction or his multiple failures on appeal. Significant to the court and Simon was the defendant's comparative disadvantage by Hale's representation of the plaintiff's of the plaintiff. Plaintiff's counsel, uh, the court explained, has access to relevant information not available to the defendant's counsel. Simon at two at uh, three three five. There is no uh, there is no such iniquity here, having relied almost exclusively on publicly available documents. The respondent possess, possesses little, if any, relevant information that Netflix does not already have. Netflix has tried but failed to show otherwise in the party's filings to date. Indeed, Netflix has turned the turned the inequity on its head. Uh, the producer defendants spent 10 years compiling countless interviews and listening to recorded phone calls. They had access to the defense team and the Avery family. As co-defendant with lawyers in common with producer defendants, it is Netflix, not the respondent, who has a wealth of information inaccessible to the opposing. Ignoring these factual distinctions, Netflix, Netflix none too subtly accuses the, the respondent of bad faith by citing Simon's court preliminary commentary that privileged statutes were clearly not meant to be used as a vehicle for a party to initiate litigation and retroactively uses a reporter's privilege to keep information out of discovery. Simon at 332. In doing so, Netflix ignores a significant distinguishing fact that it well that it is well aware of. While Hale, while Hale joined a legal team in a place within a week of Simon's release, and well after the complaint had been filed, Simon at 3.30, the respondent filed the complaint as sole counsel after Mr. Colburn's attempt to secure other counsel fail, at least possibly at, at the last possible moment before the statute of limitations expired. Docket 72, Declaration of Michael Riesbach. It appears that Simon's court's cautionary note against reading too much into the decision was lost on Netflix. Thus, we caution that the pres presidential, I don't think that's right, pres presidential value of, his, of this opinion to resolve waiver under Illinois reporter privilege should be con considered cautiously. The issue of waiver under the act is complex and very factually driven. The factual scenario presented here is extremely unique. We believe that the legal analysis of waiver and other contexts will require far more detailed considerations. Simon at 336. It is generally unwise to ascribe another's motivation, even a litigant or an attorney's, but it is difficult not to suspect that Netflix is seeking something other than documents from its respondent that it neither needs nor is entitled to. Undoubtedly, in the court's chagrin. This lawsuit plays out in the context of an ongoing public controversy between supporters of Mr. Avery, his past, and his current attorneys, and Netflix, and the producer defendants on one hand, and those who have dared to cry fire. An attempt to rebut making a murder's false claims on the other. Netflix should receive whatever discovery it is entitled to under the law, but it should not be permitted to con complete Mr. Colburn's lawsuit, the respondents' books, or the executive producer's work on as yet unsold competing documentary, competing documentary, interesting, to distract, harass, and embarrass. Docket 222, Declaration of Isabella Salonenmo Nezi, I can't pronounce her name, with accompanying five exhibits. Respondent respectfully asked the court to take this reality into account as it considers the facts and applicable. Conclusion. For all those reasons and for the reasons set forth in this initial brief, the respondent respectfully requested the court deny Netflix motion to compel dated June 8, 2022.
respectfully submitted by Michael Reesbaugh. Man, he really doesn't want to give up this shit, does he? No, he doesn't. Nope. He's fighting it tooth and nail. Look who's here. Sunshine Christina. Hey, Christina. Hey. I was shocked to see y'all were live. Hey, girl. Hi. What's, what's up? Not much. I missed... um. Like the first, I only caught the last couple of pages. Um, so is Griesbach claiming to have wrote this? That would what, what, what we what we what we just read, yeah, yeah. That's interesting. So, um, the hail, H A L E, the attorney mentioned in the murder in the park, is that yeah. Andy Hale? Or is that yeah. a different? Yeah, it's Andy Hill. Yeah. Yeah. Isn't that yeah. interesting? Well, sure, yeah. because he's the he's the other half of of uh, convicting. Yep, right. yep. Um, I, there's no coincidences in this case. No, 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 no. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> now that's interesting because he sure thinks that he is the smartest attorney to ever walk the earth. And there's a lot of uh, innuendo just in what I was able to read that y'all, um, that Jack's read. There's a lot of innuendo implied in this legal, uh, this uh, response, trying to make claims that they're fishing for documents to use in Stevens' criminal proceeding is quite a uh, ballsy of him isn't it no well, it's it's definitely something yeah and i would think that the the more appropriate stance to take would be since he's claiming the documentary is false because it says it in there that that's what they're saying right false documentary if it's a false documentary then anything you have shouldn't be of a concern and he's sure he's sure he's sure going from here to hell and back to to not produce it yeah so if if this if this is indeed a false documentary stephen avery is guilty and the conviction was rightfully obtained michael griesbach should not have anything to worry about and should give his his documents over so to cry like this, one has to wonder what he has he does give up. In my opinion. Yeah, exactly. It's it's it's, uh, it, it's really it's really quite shocking why what what he's really fighting against because I don't get it. I really don't. Mm-mm. Me no. he does protest too much. Yeah. Amen. <laughs> Amen. Well, we've, got, we've, we've got we've got a few more to go. I don't think any of these are long enough, but uh, honestly, I don't remember. I may open up another one. It might be 50 pages. I just don't remember. I don't recall. The next one is just Grace Box, um declaration that he overheard that in the meeting. But yeah, this is uh, document hey. 242. Yeah. You want to read that one? Or you want me to do it? Sure. Sure, I'll read it. <clears throat> declaration of Michael Grace Box. I, Michael Griesbach, under penalty of perjury and subject to 28 U.S.C. of 1746, declare as follows. Number one, I am one of the plaintiff's attorneys in this case and am also the respondent in the document subpoena that is the subject of motion to compel in the instant brief. Number two, on March 11, 2022, my former attorney, John Mayer, conducted a meet and confer via telephonic conference with Netflix counsel, Lita Walker, regarding the subpoena Netflix served upon me. Number three, I was in attorney Mayer's office at his law firm in Manitowoc during the meet and confer and could hear the entire conversation as attorney Mayer's uh, speakerphone was on. Number four, 
During the conference, Attorney Mayer informed Ms. Walker that among my objections to the subpoena was that the majority of the document requests called for production of documents that were privileged under Wisconsin's reporter privilege statute. I declare under penalty of perjury that the foregoing is true and correct. Dated June 8, 2022, Michael Griesbach. Okay, that seems a we little silly. For... Yep. Sapper cops here. Will Sapper cop back? Yeah, I had we'll to jump back. off for a bit. Oh, okay. Well, welcome back. Thanks for thanks for coming back. Have you? Well, I guess you probably got to. Well, maybe you got to hear the the last one, but it that's the was the the brief of Greasebach and man, did he drone on? About this reporter privilege. He just won't let it go. No, because uh, that, that's the only thing he can try to hang his hat on, and I don't see how he's going to succeed. Well, so when we were listening to the oral arguments, didn't Lita Walker say he did not submit reporters privilege right not originally no no yes she did say that and he didn't but now he's saying oh well yeah they they said that in this meet and confer telephonic conference but you know i think he was sitting around the other day and said oh wait a minute now i remember (laughs) <laughs> well, you would th- you would, guys wouldn't you think that these lawyers would record these i mean i mean he tell each other recording you, of that is that yeah what? i mean mm-hmm. th- tell each other hey guys we need to record this for posterity just to make sure we're straight you know well i, I think that i think it's going to seems how he didn't um file the motion for reporters privilege it's going to be hard for him to try and retroactively state he claimed reporters privilege because i think i i don't know i wish i was an attorney so i would know how to look up the legal precedent for someone who didn't claim reporters privilege who's well, not you, claiming reporters you, privilege. you, you just that. have to read read netflix's response it tells you right there yeah and you okay. know to, for that kind they of stuff you, it all out. you need um, all right. you need access to westlaw which you can hammer in a few key keywords and you can pull up everything that's been filed basically Right. Is that a free site? No, no, no. You got you got to be a lawyer. Oh, okay. Yeah. We, we could. Hey, we could sneak over to Cherie's house and steal her lawyer, her bar card, and log in. <laughs> I'm, I'm kidding. You beat my ass. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> anyway. And there's probably so much to, like, well, I shouldn't say that. Um, I'm sure there's more than one or two cases. To because this is such an issue, right? But well, yeah, it would but be, they're they're wanting to really hammer on that Netflix used uh, an Illinois case okay. instead of a Wisconsin case. That's what they're another part that they've hammered on a number of times. And and I think that's because now that you mention that, I think that's because there's not a precedent for this because he's so. So let's let's get this right. So he's a DA who was involved in the case. No matter how much they want to minimize his involvement, he was involved. All right. He was deposed in the civil suit. He helped draft warrants in the murder investigation. And then he wrote several books, one of which was published by the American Bar Association (laughs) on the case. And then now he's representing someone. Yeah, I don't see how he can claim I'm a reporter and, and and I can't be deposed when he has 
this is what happened when what happens when greed comes into play. Well, because, he's say, he's saying he's saying he don't have he, he shouldn't be forced to uh, turn over any material that he has in connection to writing his books. That then Netflix is saying, hey, you've got information that we can't get publicly, uh, and we we need that. We may need that whether they use it or not in their case per se. They mm-hmm. reserve they sh- they're saying they reserve the right to what he's got because he may have information that this, they're they're unaware of. Yeah, and he doesn't want to be deposed either, right? Um, he's fighting de- being deposed too. Uh, I I don't know about that. No, I, no, well, I think it's just it's, discovery. Okay. Yeah, his 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 main argument is just trying to hide the stuff that he was getting from Andy and Brenda. Exactly. And did you did were you uh, did were you able to tune in and listen to when um, Susan read Exhibit Eleven or no? Uh, is that the the back and forth with uh, yeah, no, him I, and Brenda? I, yeah, I was talking about Christine. I knew you, I know you were here, Christine. Did you get to hear that? No. no Exhibit eleven. No. I'll flip back over to it here just briefly. Okay. Ex- Exhibit eleven is a series of email messages. Oh, really? And you, gotta, and you yeah, and you well, there's not many. There's just a few. And starting okay. at the the bottom, of, you you got to start at the bottom and go up because it's. I'm sure it's. Um, probably Outlook or some shit, you know, it does it back. But it is a series of emails between uh, Brenda Schuler, Andy, and Michael Griesbach. And this is dated. If you look at the date on the screen there, this is December of 2018. Right, This is right before they filed. And she's helping to draft the filing. Really? Really. Yeah. She helped edit and write it. Yeah, absolutely. It's it's all right there. Let's go slay some dragons. Is this in the description? It's just uh, this is document two forty two forty dash three. Okay, so, it is in the foul play library. I think it is. Uh, no, it's not yet. No, I, I doubt. Well, I'm, I doubt it's always put in there yet. If it's not, it will be. Okay. She put some in there today. I'm not sure which oh, ones. I think. Oh, did, oh, did she? Good for her. Go yeah, Zoe. Okay. Yep. All right. Let's see. So to Barb, B. Colburn. That was Colburn's wife. Yes, yeah, that was Col- Yeah, it's Colburn's ex-wife. They're divorced and now, and you know he's blaming Ma'am for pretty much everything that's happened to him. And why? What does I that? I don't know. I don't know why she was part of that. Yeah, why is she in, why is he emailing his wife? Was Colburn using her account, maybe? I think, I think, I think, I think that, um, I think this opens the door to get all those emails, too. Uh, Maybe. Yeah, that's interesting. That would help to know about the divorce. Mm. So to Barb, yeah, from Colburn forward pages one through nine. Yeah, he's he's forwarded some materials there, but yeah, like I said, you start at the bottom and work your way up. Okay, let's see. Foul play site. Let me well, see. It, you can just look in the video description. All the documents that are that we're reading tonight are in the video okay. description. I linked everything to it's on my OneDrive, so. You can find okay. it very quickly that way. All right, I'm there uh, now. Let's now let's move on to uh, document. Uh, this is number two forty three, and it's two pages. And I'll do this. One. Okay, this one's Mo- funny. I think. <laughs> yeah, motion to. Ex- this is from um, from Greasebox. Motion to extend time to file supplemental brief. Attorney Michael Griesbach, co-counsel for the plaintiff, and respondent in Netflix's motion to compel production of documents in response to subpoena respectfully moves for an extension of time pursuant to federal rules of civil procedure 6, B, 1, and B. Uh, The motion is based upon the following. Number one, the court directed the parties to file some of the analyst supplemental briefs on or before June 8, 2022. 
Number two, the respondent, after discharging counsel, completed his brief at approximately 11.30 p.m. on June 8th. So, late last night. Last Number, night. Yeah. <laughs> Number three, immediately after completing his brief, respondent tried but failed to e-file it. Number four, although the respondent has e-filed numerous pleadings and documents in the Wisconsin Circuit Court, he has not previously done so in a federal court, as this case is the only case he has appeared in a fed- in federal court. That's surprising given his long career, but anyway, number five. I, I, I'm crying. I'm yeah. so <laughs> Do you need a towel? Oh, yes. <laughs> number five. The respondent should have allowed more time to familiarize himself with the federal court e-filing system, but he failed to do so. Number six. So. Yeah. Having fi- Having failed to successfully e-file his brief, the respondent notified opposing counsel by email explaining the circumstances and attaching the briefs. He attached a grease box declaration with accompanying exhibit. Number I have seven. A <laughs> number seven. The respondent's yep. brief had not been altered in any respect since he completed it prior to the deadline and emailed it to the mm. opposing counsel. Yes, yeah, sure, my. <laughs> Uh, number eight, the respondent believes that the circumstances detailed above constitute, quote, excusable neglect under Rule six, <laughs> six B one B. Wherefore, the respondent respectfully requests that the court grant him a one day extension to file his brief, which is being filed contemporaneously with this motion, dated June nine, twenty twenty two. Michael Grease. Did so, we get a response to that, um, Jack? Do you know? Uh, wh- whatever is on this next document, number 240, is this 244? So let's, nope, there's no- le- let's, let's let this be a lesson. When you try and profit off of a lie that you know is a lie, nothing's going to go right, okay? <laughs> <laughs> You're going to <laughs> like an idiot every turn of the page you are going to look like you are a slimy individual trying to make trying to trying to make money off of a man you have wrongfully convicted and people trying to expose you for doing so uh, I think this is I a mean, stall tactic, like others have said. I don't know why the stall for one day is really going to matter, but. Yeah. No, I it's, think. It's he, really only because he didn't finish it until after the deadline. Yeah. That's why. Yeah. He yeah, finished it at 1130. Yeah, my ass. <laughs> I just yeah. don't believe him. Well, considering, well, what we, well, considering what we just read, I don't either. What's that? What's that, Christine? Yeah. His, his brother is a judge in the federal system. So if he really wanted to file it on time, he could have called his brother and said, hey, brother of yeah. mine, how do I file a document in the federal court? <laughs> right. Yep. Yeah. How do you, I can't believe it'd be that difficult. I really, I just really can't. But Yeah. So, yeah, uh, half an hour for God's sake. 29 yeah, really. Minutes and Absolutely. I mean, how long does it take to? Seconds. How long does it take to open up and get to your your case number and what attach your brief and be done? Hit send. And push a button. Yeah. Push send, well, yeah. What's interesting is, you know what? Get the, so that's interesting because. He's claiming he's never filed a document, but yet he has his name on documents that have been filed in this court. So, well, he had a lawyer. He had a lawyer (laughs) doing it. Yeah, just when he uh, fired when he should can. But supposedly, he filed Andrew Colburn's original complaint. Maybe his secretary. I, I, but I don't still, know. That, I, I, I I don't know that he filed that one. Yeah, I'm not buying this. 
I'm not buying it either. Well, I, I we don't, don't. We don't. We don't buy it either. We just, it's probably exactly what Susan said. He wasn't done. Yeah. And this probably last one, this last. 2.30 in the morning. Yeah. This last one, declaration of Michael Griesbach. I'm Michael Griesbach under the penalty of perjury. 28 U.S.C. Uh, 1746 to clarify follows. The attached exhibit, Exhibit 1, is true and accurate copy of the email I sent opposing counsel at 12.18 a.m. on June 9, 2022, as referenced in the counsel's motion to extend time, dated June 9, 2022. So why did it take him 18 minutes to send them an email? <laughs> he wasn't able to file it. Uh, yeah, I, uh, you know, I, I don't know. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. See there? Yeah, and uh, Susan had asked me earlier and I, I don't have an answer because I did kind of stop and look because it caught my attention. Let me see here. Get over here to it. We were talking about it. Uh, uh, da, da, da. Uh, documents 238 and 239. Uh, I don't have them. Or if I do, yeah. they're, I don't know where they're at. I don't know if I want to suspect and say these are documents that are the text messages that we didn't get. I don't know that. So either I've missed them somewhere along the line, but I don't think I did. But I, I will double check what I've got. There's been, I mean, like today alone, was, there was like nine documents that we got that Sherry got us. So, I'll, but I'll, I'll double, I'll double check. This email he's talking about here was not attached. Exhibit one that he sent to uh, uh, Netflix, Salida, or whoever about him, you know, filing for an extension of a yeah, day. Yeah, there, yeah. There's no, there's no attachment to this PDF at uh-huh. all. So, I think this. Actually, I think of today's filings. There was only one that had an attachment. I think I've already closed. That was uh, his uh, his declaring that uh, he was there for the phone conference and heard them tell Netflix that he was stating reporter privilege. Yeah. So, anyway. Yeah, I don't know, but, but yeah, 238, 239, I don't know where they're at, but I will double check what I have. So, with that said, um, any comments, questions? I know I have a lot. I know I have, I, I know I have a lot of commentary about this whole thing because, uh, I, you know, I don't know where this is going to lead. Um, this this third party involvement, I don't think any of us really do, not yet. But it it clearly started years ago. And How would uh, you know that she just gave us seven hour deposition. Yeah, I'm not. Um, I'm not entirely sure that we'll ever get the deposit the, those depositions. Um, I've yeah. talked to some other people and. I think they'll probably keep those under wraps. Jeff, you got a comment? I kind of had a question for the panel. Uh, Maybe the question is, for Netflix's point of view, is this this is not about money, and not at least not in the short term. Would you guys agree with that? That like the little bit of money uh, money that he could have could get, it pales in comparison to the. I don't know the the flood of of lawsuits and, they could be coming their way in the future because yeah. if he gets a, if he gets a little then that's going to open the floodgates for more uh, so like that's why they did that's that's my question Are you, do you guys all agree on that absolutely absolutely this okay. is this is a precedent setting case if Colburn is successful. 
it's not only going to even if he gets a dime right even if he gets yeah. ten dollars it, yeah it's a big yeah it's because 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 this will hinder and cause anyone wanting to expose wrongful convictions it's going to make them think can i afford legal representation to defend myself in a lawsuit well right? there's there's a there's another big side of this too it's the precedent setting of uh these networks being able to produce you know anything that's of a factual based on factual events blah 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 you think about the id channel just think about that and the number of, of shows that they have on many of them are based uh, around true events you know and but they they dramatize the hell out of it so i, I think it's has far-reaching uh, implications not only for netflix but other studios as well i think that it's already taught netflix not to cut and splice actual court testimony absolutely it aggravated me when they you know when they did it but yeah what's that sound? well netflix didn't do it anyway it was ricardi and damas they're the ones that did all the editing because what they submitted to netflix was initially was just a, a piece of their product so they could get you know, to see if it was even something they wanted to go after. And then when Netflix gave them the go-ahead, it was Ricardi and DeMoss that did all the editing and all of that stuff and then submitted the finished product to Netflix. Are you certain about that, Zapper? Because what I recall is that Netflix gave them people to work with them. Uh, well, in no, editing I, I, and... Yeah, I, I can't say with 100% certainty, but if, you know, in in watching a lot of other docu-series or, or having seen stuff from documentary filmmakers is there it's their product so even if netflix gave them someone to assist i don't think they were going to be the driver i think it was still going to be ricardi and Damas that was going to have the final word on what you know whether they were going to listen to what netflix was telling them if that was the case or not um i don't know yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. I, I can't say with 100 percent certainty but as I recall, they had, I think, seven full episodes completed. I could be wrong on that, but they had a certain number completed when they pitched Netflix. And then the remainder, I think, I think there were Netflix employees that um, Helped them. worked on it as well. Yeah. Yeah. And another thing, um, and I, I'm, feel pretty comfortable in saying that most of these big studios, probably even some of the smaller ones consult, but these larger ones, they have lawyers that probably are involved at least to some degree, especially when you're presenting this kind of stuff. Would everyone agree with that? Yes, no? Yes. Not in the business to know. I don't know. I would think so, just from to protect themselves, I, you know. Yeah. Still, I, I still think far, the far, far region. What's that? What's that, Christina? This is off topic. Um, I'm reading through the inter interrogatory um, document. Has yeah. anyone sent Lita Walker Bobby Salas's letter? That I can't, I, I don't know. Send it to her. I'm fixing to right now because they're trying to act like um, Ricardi and Demos should have known better and not um, actually entertain Link and Colburn doing something nefarious. Um, and that the defense was throwing something at the wall to try and make a guilty man look innocent. But we know from the Bobby Salas letter that everyone, and, the, and that letter was written, I believe, in 08. That's right. So 
seven years prior to Netflix. And Bobby Salas was saying the same things as as everyone who watched Making a Murderer, except for, you know, those who helped wrongfully convict Stephen Avery, that um, the cops framed him. Plain and simple. I was I mean, saying earlier that, that Rick Mahler kind of said the same thing that sat on the jury. <laughs> yeah. 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 That That is interesting. And, and you know, that might be, I mean, I don't know. You know why you're sending that? If you're going to send that to uh, Lita, uh, Christina, uh -huh. you, uh, you might want to mention that interview that uh, Mark Rottendott did with uh, Rick Mahler because He's sitting on the jury. Absolutely. And he, I, I didn't watch it, uh, Susan. Tell tell Christina what, what happened. He just said that he thought Coburn looked uh, really sketchy and he was sweaty on the stand and he didn't believe anything he had to say. Uh, and that's, you know, right after the trial when they're going into deliberations. Yeah. Okay. And that's a Mark Hardenot interview? Yeah, it's yeah. on YouTube. It's on his channel. his channel. Mark it's on, yeah, it's on his channel. Okay. He just did it a couple days ago. Oh, there's, there's actually a part three I haven't seen yet. Okay. Is it out? It's, it's two parts, yeah. Part we, three is out? Oh, I don't know. I haven't seen it. Hmm. But yeah, I think I'm, that would be really helpful to Netflix. Yeah, and they, they they might want to they might they might want to depose him, you know. Yeah, they should. I mean, I, I mean, I, I don't. He was on the jury for you know whatever the trial lasted there almost a month, so he got to see this, uh, at least uh, him being on the stand and maybe other aspects that you know, uh, you know, kind of an intangible, but you know, he's a witness. So, yeah. Mm -hmm. Who is that I, Bobby guy you were talking about, Christina? Bobby Salas. Oh, yeah. There's a letter that oh, Tim Tedious oh, oh, dredged up. Tedious did a post and found this letter. It's on, we talked about it briefly on either an open mic or a crime theory. It's I a, know I read it, but I can't remember who he is. He was a prisoner. And what's interesting is oh. if, if Dark Side. Yeah to him he's wrongfully convicted or let me rephrase that in my opinion it is highly likely that he's wrongfully convicted as well and what's interesting is in that 13 page letter he never mentioned his case at all he wasn't no. trying to say, they framed me too i know what you're going through he wasn't all he was worried about was telling Stephen Avery, this is what you need to do. This is what likely happened. The only thing that I found a little odd is, and that's because people think if you confess, you're guilty. Even wrongfully convicted people think if you confess, you're guilty, right? And he thought that um, it was Brendan, that Brendan had something to do with it. Um, but that's- Yeah, I remember it now, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But that's because it's it's hard for people who would never admit to something they didn't do, or so they think. Um, it's hard for them to think that it's it can be done, um, and that's why you know that's why they convicted Brendan because people. I think it's getting better now. You know, because we're seeing so many people um, be released, but and and it's televised a lot more. Well, but it's more trans. It's more. It's more transparent now. Yeah, and, but um, but that you know that is the one thing about the letter that um, you know. But like Tim Tedious said, oh, and there was like some witness or something. It's it's. I'm gonna send her the letter, and I'll send her yeah. the link to Mark Codnot's, uh video or interview with Rick Muller too. Yeah. And and just mention, you know, his impression of Colburn in that interview. Maybe. Just to let her know what to look for. Yeah, yeah the con the context. Yeah. 
Well, it, it'll be interesting. I mean, uh, I don't know if we'll get anything tomorrow. Hopefully we will. Um, and uh, what, whatever the case may be, I mean, this involvement of a third party and and actually much more involvement than than what I thought reading this, you know, exhibit, uh, ex exhibit 11 at Manet, uh I just don't know what it could mean. And we need, we need a lawyer to tell us to help us out there. So um, we'll have to talk to Sheree and, and get, I mean, I know she's a newer lawyer. She may not have as much insight, but you know, someone like Travis, maybe that's a good question. Maybe that's, that's a good question I can pose in the, in the, that room that I created for him and he can give us some insight. Perfect. Yeah. Yeah. All righty. I guess we've covered it pretty much as we can. This uh, again, this was a last second kind of thing. I kind of sprung on everyone. I really appreciate Susan and everyone jumping in and, you know, listening to us get through these um, other, I think there were 13 documents in total. I mean, you know, you know, most of them were one or two pages granted. I will finally learn that CST means EST to you. Well, you just have to say, Jack, uh, what what time what time did you say? You need to really think about this now. Put your thinking cap on. I've done that like I've done that like five times now. Yeah, I, sh I should have known. Yeah, you should have. I should have known. I should. I try to duck my double check myself when I'm writing these times now because we're scattered so much. But yeah, anyway. yeah, I um oh. I struggle with that too um the you know because i think we you and i jacks are the only est people no sherry is EST. Sherry, yeah sherry um, is EST. sherry is est there's a yeah there's yeah there's a few more. yeah me but right. mainly right. me and you and, Sh and sherry i mean uh, that that's in the game mm -hmm. but everybody else seems yeah. to be central or you know, uh, mountain or, or uh, you know, West Coasters, and then we move into Europe, and poor mm -hmm. Alice, poor Alice, when I made the announcement, she's like, I can't stay up, it's like 2.30 in the morning, I'm like, go to bed. <laughs> yeah. So. yeah, no way. All right, well, that's what I'm fixing to do. I'm glad I got to, uh, to, to participate a little bit and read some of these, um, and uh, yeah. Like this this is a this this case is becoming more interesting by the filing, isn't it? Absolutely. Like, well, if, it, if they would finally get past the reporter's privilege crap, it might be. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I just don't I just don't see how the well I don't know I just don't see how this judge is going to let that fly. I think he's going to say you you need to turn over what you got. I don't, I'm not buying this reporter privilege stuff. I just don't, that's, that's just my opinion, unlawyer opinion. So. Alrighty. If there's nothing else, again, I appreciate everyone coming along. Appreciate everyone uh, there in, the, in the live chat for coming and listening. And, uh, you know, if there's any, any, uh, suggestions you guys have for us, you know, let us know. Uh, we'll try to, we covered a broad cover, a broad range of, of different things and subjects and so forth. And we're, you know, we're open if we can, you know, if there's interest in the case or whatever. And, you know, you never know. We'll try to get to it. This one's pretty big. I mean, this is another civil case, which again, it really interests me. The, the process of, uh, we saw it um, on the big screen for six weeks with the, this previous trial we just watched. This one is just as interesting. And actually Sherry Lynn Pantillo had asked for, what information we have, uh, actually, I'm going to try to do that after we get off of here. What information we have on the uh, Avery civil suit, and we don't really have much. There was, really wasn't a lot to it. And I I don't think there's any kind of recorded, con I know they had some several telephonic conferences because people being, again, scattered, kind of like in this case, you know, they get on the, a conference call, which is the best thing to do. But I don't, I don't think there's any recorded conversations. If there are, I, I'm not even sure. We could probably look into it. It would, might be interesting to hear, but we have really not that much information, but I'm going to try to get everything that we have got to her. So, all right. Anyway, um, if you haven't hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, come tell us, come visit us, hit that bell. Appreciate everyone.
And with that, this has been a File Play production. But I know just y'all.